pretty orange seats and fancy state-of-the-art modern Mitsubishi TV scoreboards, which I might add, very pissing me off all the time, like TV, uh, blast their signal during commercials. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, in case you've never been to Joe Robbie, on the screen, when they're not replaying parts of the ball game, they are putting on commercials for Toyota and Channel 10 and whoever else is advertising. And they turn up the volume about 10 notches whenever they do a commercial. And it really pisses you off, if you know what I mean. You don't like sitting in the damn ballpark, which you've already paid for parking and your ticket, and uh, watching a live game. And suddenly have Mr. Whipple yelling at you that you need toilet paper. But that's what it's like at Joe Rob. In fact, I think you can count no less than 30 commercials for different products during any game at Joe Robbie. And ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest to you at the Orange Bowl, no such thing would ever happen. No, at the Orange Bowl... You kind of just sat there and you yelled at the guy next to you who was screaming too loud and it was echoing back in your head. And the smell of urine was in the air and the smell of beer was everywhere. And it was uh, just a blast from the moment you had to fight for parking to the line on 836 getting out of the stadium. But the real question here, and we can't discuss this without bringing up the Miami Heat as well, because the Miami Heat have announced that they're not all content with the Miami Arena in Overtown, like we ever thought they would be. Like, why the hell did they build it there to begin with? Like, maybe that's why a lot of people from Broward County are very pissed at the Heat. You know what I mean? And uh, when their lease is up, after they extract some more promises from Miami, which apparently are not coming the way they want them, uh, they may move to a suburban location next to Joe Robbie Stadium. Meadowlands, too. Kind of like the Philadelphia Veterans Stadium will have the basketball arena next to the baseball and football arenas. Not a bad idea. Certainly be a lot more convenient for us West Broward people who have a difficult time doing the Miami arena during season. And particularly if you do a 5 a.m. get, you know, if you get a 5 a.m. wake-up call every morning. It's rough to be at the arena till 10, 15, 10, 30, and then uh, get home at 11 o'clock. The toughest part about going to the Miami Heat games, incidentally, is I can manage to stay awake for the Heat games, but the games are so exciting, it is an emotional drain, a physical and emotional drain, to come out of those games at uh, 10 o'clock or 10, 30, then try going to bed at 11 o'clock and waking up at 5 a.m. You're, you're too exhausted. Your, your body needs to unwind, need a longer sleep. As compared to uh, watching TV on Sunday night when you could fall asleep at 7.30 and wake up at 5 and do fine for radio. Anyway, it has uh, given me an inspiration, Dave Hyde's column has, for those of you that are Dow fans and listen to my show. And this is a good indication for me to find out who actually listens to my show that also watches the Dolphins and has been to Joe Robbie Arena. Are you satisfied? Here's the question. It's a one of those seven three three fourteen hundred question with all sorts of bonuses and surprises. Oh, by the way, have I said this is uh, Monday, September twenty first, and this is the Norm Kent show, and this is Norm Kent, and that we have a big dinner at seven o'clock tonight at Brothers with over a hundred and forty seven reservations already recorded. That we're going to have a microphone at the table. That uh, we're still looking for a ride for Florence. If anybody wants to make some extra money, Florence wants a ride there, and she will pay. That's because she says she was raped by a yellow cab driver. She won't call one of those guys. And uh, she can't get transported by Dr. Spock because he's off on a Vulcan mission this week. But Florence is willing to pay for a ride there. Bosco, if you're listening, uh, 100 bucks for the limo back and forth for uh, Florence. Maybe she'll pay it. I don't know. The woman says she's rich. She used to be a psychologist. Her husband won the lottery once. Anyway... Aside from that, you can call and make reservations at 968-5881. 968-5881. I tell you there will be a special section there for fans of Pat Stevens and Dateless and Desperate. 
Uh, although Charlie Beto repeatedly interrupted me with his gratuitous insults, that's one of the things you're going to have to learn, Charlie, if you want to be a talk show host. Insults are appropriate as a response to a caller, but gratuitous insults are unnecessary and unworthy of you and will only alienate your audience. So uh, I pointed out, I invited uh, Charlie and uh, Jimmy also. They uh, do the show Queer Talk on Saturday nights. That's right, Saturday nights, 8 to 11 now. Pat Stevens does Dateless and Desperate, I guess, 5 to 8. So I invited the Dateless and Desperate listeners on Saturday night. I told them we're going to have a special section for them. And uh, for Queer Talk listeners, we will also have a special section. And uh, as Jimmy said, he wants a special fruit plate just for him. 23 minutes after 6 a.m., so the entire FTL family, friends, and foes will be there. I think uh, Neil Rogers might show up also. He might just uh, show up with his Corvette outside brothers and uh, stand there with the microphone just saying, hey, I can't believe the light bulb brought this many people. So it is 23 minutes after 6 a.m. Dave Hyde's column, Heart versus State of the Art, is the best phrase I could title it with. And for those of you that have been to Joe Robbie, and 20,000 of you did not show up yesterday for the Ram Dolphin game, my question is, do you like the stadium? Does it have the heart of uh, the Orange Bowl? Or have we created the equivalent of one of those uh, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, modern stadiums that are all drab and no soul? And will that affect the way we feel about our Marlins and the baseball team? You know, when you have a ballpark, when it gets a little too hot, they turn on the air conditioning. When it gets a little too... Uh, hot, you can just walk into the uh, indoor area and watch it on computerized TVs. you got to wonder here whether or not we've created a real uh, heart and soul park for the fans. So 733-1400, that's one of the calls we are taking early on this morning. I have to get a head start on Jimmy Cephalo, who's going to be doing QAM Morning Drive. Starting Wednesday, I understand, is uh, Jimmy Cephalo's debut, and I just want to show Jimmy and QAM people and uh, Hank Goldberg, if he's lonely and outspoken, that uh, we can do sports here on uh, FTL2. Besides, if we do sports between 6 and 7 a.m., Steve Kane will never know. So we can do six to seven sports, get away with it. Kane will wake up, then I'll be bashing him or doing something political, and he'll never know that I was doing sports this early in the morning. It will be your secret and mine. Might point out at the same time that uh, the programming here, was, was it here or uh, Hank Goldberg, here at my show, uh, I, I expect Hank to be a guest. Now, Hank has some litigation problems with... W-I-O-D, and it may prevent him from getting on too many radio talk shows, but I can tell you that I've lined up some great guests for this week. And again, uh, it's just between you and me. We can't tell Nick Lawrence that I've booked these guests, because he'll get all upset. But I hope to have Brian Norcross on one day later this week, and Hank Goldberg as well. So, the next question, and I, I got this idea, by the way, from reading the column in the Sun Sentinel yesterday about uh, Pete Rose. Pete Rose, of course, will be opening up a sports bar in Boca Raton, the mouth of the rat, not too distant future, he says. He's living in Boca now with his second wife, a former stewardess, and their two children, new children. He has, already has a grown-up kid, about 21 years old, playing baseball. And uh, he's got another kid named Tyler, I think another daughter named Carol, all pretty young. And he was doing his radio show, his 800 Talk Net show, and... He did a topic which I thought was pretty interesting, and I thought was pretty safe and would attract some of you old-timers out there, women, men, whether it's Esther Williams or Sugar Ray Robinson. Who do you think was the greatest athlete that ever lived? I thought that this would be an interesting topic to kind of start off Mondays. Mondays tend to be kind of slow, kind of be an arduous thing for us, and try to come up with a topic that you would feel safe with, that you would be comfortable chatting about and sharing with me. It's either that or I tell you the story about the swordfish I ate in a restaurant last week and uh, wound up throwing in their toilet so as not to insult the owner of the restaurant. And did you know that in three out of four instances, swordfish does not flush down a toilet? But I'll tell you more about that later. The question is, who do you think was the greatest athlete of all time? 
All I could say is Al Knight must leave me one hell of a listening audience. By the time he gets done singing his serenades, I don't know if anybody's alive. But uh, 733-1400 in Broward, 1-800-874-3454 in Dade and Palm Beach, and star 385 on your Bell South mobility line. What we will try to do for 30 or 45 minutes is to get your perspective on who you think the greatest athlete who ever lived was. Now, you could start with 1991 and say, well, look at Deion Sanders. He's a multi-sport player, as was Bo Jackson. But look how quickly their flames burned out, or certainly Bo Jackson's did. Do you go back to somebody like the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio, who was kind enough to donate his name and autograph to a wing of a hospital in Hollywood? Or do we say somebody like Muhammad Ali, he floated like a butterfly, he sting like a bee, he said he was going to take list and he did it in three, Muhammad Ali. Who could ever forget him? The poet who became a champ, who became a war resistor. Was he the greatest athlete of all time, or was it Jesse Owens in the Munich Olympics? Was it Bruce Jenner with the decathlon victory? Was it somebody like Pete Rose, who could play baseball at every single position and be an all-star at each one of them? Someone who would lead not only the Cincinnati Reds to success and championships, but the Philadelphia Phils. And whatever team he would play on, it would seem to do better. Who is the greatest athlete? Sid Luckman? Ma Throneberry? Casey Stingle? Who's the greatest athlete that ever lived? What's that Hitchcock belt they give out? What do you think? Something we can certainly think about and talk about when we come back after the 6.30 break. First, I have to tell you... Absolutely right. So, um... You know, that's, that's the problem there, too. And the tragedy is that's where they are appealing to get so many of their patrons. So to hear that 18,000 people did not show up yesterday, not only is it no great surprise, it either speaks out against the stadium or the traffic or that more people are getting satellite dishes. It's their home opener, for Christ's sake. That's right. Well, as I said, I still think the old Orange Bowl was a lot more fun to go to, and I think the crowd down there was a lot more into it than they are in JRS. I don't know what the difference is. I don't know how to explain it, but Got the Orange Bowl, like I said. I think it's the difference between the suburbs and driving to work uh, in your car and being on a suburb subway. Well, that could be. But uh, just wanted to toss in my opinion. Uh, I'll, I'll keep going, you know, and fighting the traffic and all the other bull crap you have to go through because I love football and the Dolphins. They're my life. But Two hours before game time you have to leave yeah, from plantation. Leave huh? o'clock. Like yesterday we left at 2 o'clock. The game was at 4. So, uh, Can you imagine those people that got stuck in traffic that got there after yeah. the score was 17 nothing in the first quarter? Yeah. Well, it happened to be one time the, uh, in the preseason games. We left a little too late. I went with a friend of mine. I was doing the driving, but they were late getting to my house. Oh, same with me. Now, I'm trying to remember what game that was where there was like 21 points scored in the first quarter. I got there and it was 21-7. Exactly. And I, I said to my husband, and I said, never again. I said, I don't care who, who, what, or where. We're leaving two hours ahead. We're getting there at least to see the kickoff, you know. And, uh, well, that's just the way it is. But if you want to vote, I'll still cast my vote for the Orange Bowl versus JRS. Delighted to hear that. And I'm anxious to see how uh, the Marlins play out next year at JRS. Yeah, me too. Although I have a tendency to believe that stadiums that are surrounded the way the Joe Robbie Stadium is by all fans. Uh huh. In other words, there's no big center field area that's completely empty. Right. Right. They tend to be okay for baseball because uh, you feel like you're an inti an in an intimate circle. Uh huh. Well, I've never been to a baseball game, I must be honest with you. Uh, I've never seen a live baseball game, so it'll be a first for me. But uh, I just wanted to toss in my opinion. I heard you on the way to work this morning, so you uh, take care. Have a good day. And okay. We'll talk again. All right. Thanks again. You bet. All right. A true Miami Dolphin fan, a season ticket holder for 13 or 14 years. I wonder where they bumped her when they moved from the Orange Bowl to the new Joe Robbie Stadium. See, that was the problem. I did not particularly want to buy club seats to the Miami Dolphins, but by acquiring club seats when I did, it assured me that when and if Major League Baseball were to come to South Florida, I would have access to those same club seats for baseball.
And therefore, I chose particularly to select club seats that while they are in the end zone in a football game for the Dolphins would be at home plate and between home plate and the third baseline for a baseball game. And I must say that the selection has indeed been rewarded and paid off remarkably because now that the Marlins have in fact signed a contract to use Joe Robbie Stadium for at least five years and I must emphasize their contract, as I understand it, despite the fact that Wayne Heisinger owns half the stadium, I think the Florida Marlins have only contracted for five years to use Joe Robbie. So who's to say that uh, Wayne won't build a dome stadium someday if we have a problem with storms and weather? But anyway, uh, I was able to select club seats that, while they weren't the best for football, were indeed what I had hoped and anticipated would be available for baseball, and I'll look forward to sharing those with my brother next year, which is very important because it might be the only time I ever get to see him. Anyway, it's 17 minutes to 7 a.m. here on Monday morning, September 21st. We are less than 12 hours away now from the start of one of the greatest WFTL nights ever at Brothers Deli. It begins at 6.30 tonight. Kane Kent Siderman, the big debate, the microphone will be out there. Worthing will probably pitch in his two cents. A special section for dateless and desperate listeners and queer talk listeners, and a special section for Florence all by herself if somebody will call her up and give her a ride there. This morning, which do you find more personal and intimate, JRS or the Orange Bowl? Who do you think is the greatest athlete in the world? And what do we have to give away for our fans and friends here at WFTL this morning? Brian, gift certificates to the Grapevine. That's right, the Grapevine Gourmet Shop, located at 256 South University Drive in Plantation, the home of gourmet food. So stay tuned to the Norm Kent Show. We will be right back. Hot Talk, 24 hours a day on AM 14 WFTL. Yeah. D did I say Jackson? Yeah, I said Jackson. Uh, Michael Jordan. Yeah. Uh, says he wants to become a pro golfer at the end of his career, and he went on an amateur tour once, and uh, right playing with the pros with Jack Nicklaus, he went ahead and scored a hole-in-one. That would mean a thing. He tried out with the Chicago White Sox one day, and while facing fastballer Jack McDowell, drove a ball into the left field stands. Uh, here's a man who at uh, college at UNC, aside from leading the team in scoring in basketball, was also a track and field star. That's so it very well may be that Michael Jordan is in the uh, classification of Babe Diedrichson. That I didn't know, but I've seen him play golf. He was in a recent golf tournament. I think it was his own. He didn't do very well in that one. But uh, from what you tell me, he's got to be an all-around man. There's no doubt about it. And, of course, he dances with Michael Jackson in TV commercials now. Get the dancing. He's a, he's, he's <laughs> the ball player. That, that you can't take it away from. Okay. Yeah. Very good. All right. Thank you for your thoughts. Go so on, now. Let's move along to line two. Good morning. Buddy. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. To me, the greatest out Jim Thorpe. Uh, Jim Thorpe. Yes, sir. For not, many people, I have a stamp with his name on it. Not and only picture. Did he do well in the Olympics, basketball, football, baseball, whatever sport this man went into, he excelled. So I would give him my vote as the greatest athlete alive. Sir. There certainly was a talented star. You remember the story about him, how he was stripped of his Olympic medals yeah, that, that was his for allegedly having, uh, you know, played in some competition where he got five dollars compensation. Well, he did that on a, on a summer job while he was storing hay out in the Midwest. He went on the local baseball team. And they paid him five dollars for one game, and for that they took away his medal. But they gave, they restored it to him. They gave him back his medal. Yes, but uh, he had to live with the agony and pain oh, of having been that's the disgraced and stripped of uh, medals that he won in the Olympics, all because he took a summer job moving hay, as you said. Right, that's right. But to me, again, not to be redundant, I, I think he's the greatest athlete that ever lived. Hmm. Good thought. Okay. Good thought. Now I have a question for you. Sure. Who played Jim Thorpe in the movie by his name? Uh, oh, I know. The guy always played with Kirk Douglas. Uh, <laughs> the hell's his name? I know who you mean. I know who you mean. I don't. I can't remember. Uh, he played Elmer Gantry, too. <laughs> Am I right? Yes, I do remember now. Now that you said he played Elmer Gantry, I know who it is. Uh, I got I got, I got, got a mental block. Uh, the Rainmaker. 
That's right. He played the Raymaker. Well, that's the one who played Jim Thorpe. Can you imagine that? I, I know this guy all the time, and I just got... Like, <laughs> Frustrating, huh? Like that. You got it. Absolutely. Hold it. Your wife must have whispered it in your ear. Oh, no. I, I, I'm single. I'm single. You did it all on your own. No, I did it all on my own. That's right. Okay. All right, Norman. All right. Take care. Right. Five minutes to 7 a.m., your thoughts, if you're just joining us, on who the greatest athlete of all time is. Your thoughts on the Orange Bowl compared to Joe Robbie Stadium. My thoughts is that the Hurricanes could probably beat the Dolphins if they played head-on right now. I, I am not impressed yet with the Dolphins, uh, folks. They are playing only some weak teams, right? We'll see. I don't see them facing any real competition. Of course, these are games they have to win to be competitive, but I don't see them facing any real competition until they go to Buffalo, and then it will be, can they contain Mr. Kelly and Thurman Thomas, a strong test of character for the Miami Dolphins. Certainly, they're putting points on the board this year, and being able to go to Bobby Humphreys on third down instead of Jim Jensen is a plus, because uh, one of these days, just when they expect Bobby Humphrey to get the ball, he'll be able to flash it out to uh, crash, and uh, we'll score a touchdown, and they won't expect it. Anyway, at 5 minutes to 7, let me just make some political comments as well. There are so many issues to talk about as you commence a show on a Monday morning following the weekend before. Not necessarily articles that you pick up out of a newspaper, because newspapers on the weekends tend to be slack in their hard news coverage. They give their reporters the days off. I mean, that's a reality. Certainly, uh, Saturday and Monday newspaper reporting tends to be very weak, and it does that because reporters are, in fact, uh, given a lot of weekend time off. And you would think that the uh, world slows down on the weekend, and it indeed does. Even the, the biggest shots are taking time off. So, uh, having said that, it is not surprising to hear that Ross Perot was suddenly back in the news uh, this Friday. And the newspapers and media sources determined that uh, we need something to stir some life into this campaign besides the debate George Bush refuses to get into. And let me point out that Mr. Kane is making a big thing about how Clinton handlers say he doesn't want a debate and it's as much his fault that there is no debate than uh, George Bush. That is not the case. Uh, Bill Clinton is prepared to debate George Bush under the terms as outlined by the Bipartisan Commission on Debates, which was set up to prepare debates. The first debate was supposed to be Tuesday night, September the 22nd. It will not be that date because solely George Bush canceled it. Solely George Bush refused to go there to Michigan State. Solely George Bush refused to accept the recommendation of the Bipartisan Commission. Whether or not Mr. Clinton's handlers wanted him to debate is inconsequential. The bottom line is that Bill Clinton has gone on the record, certainly the last two days in public statements, and said he is prepared to debate George Bush one-on-one -on -one with one moderator, exactly as the Bipartisan Commission has suggested. And he was ready to go. And he was ready to go even with a moderator form of debate. But uh, Mr. Bush was uh, not willing to debate. That's the bottom line. And I think it's foolish of George Bush not to debate. Certainly anyone running for president has to, has to have an opportunity to look presidential. But I'm not even sure that these debates will be pulled off this year because uh, everybody's attitudes in this political year are different than they were before. And it would be a travesty if they don't ultimately debate. It just will. So I'm not sure it will happen. I would like to believe it's going to happen. I can't believe it would not happen. Certainly George Bush has nothing to be afraid of, and Bill Clinton has uh, a lot to gain. But anyway, it's a joke that there has not been a debate, or right now it doesn't appear as if there's going to be one. But a bigger joke than that is H. Ross Chameau saying that uh, the only way he can advertise his economic program is if he becomes a presidential candidate because you see if you're a political candidate you get lower rates for radio and television advertising than if you're not a candidate so for Ross Perot to say that the only way I can advertise my economic plan is by becoming a candidate is a lie what he means and what he's trying to do is extract a lower discount rate from the TV people 
to espouse that economic plan. However, he is on the ballot in all 50 states, and uh, if he thinks he is going to engineer some sort of time machine, all these people that think he is a, a brilliant strategist, and by dropping out of the race for eight weeks, he's suddenly going to come back in and gain new life, well, they're fooling themselves. His bird has soared. It's crash-landed. His campaign is over. It's 7 a.m. on the Norm Kent Show. Florida's talk leader, AM 14, WFTL, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. The medicinal use of marijuana and the involvement I had was to share with the San Francisco County Board of Supervisors and those people that were conferring on national attempts to make marijuana available medicinally. Well, these people, these good people today demonstrate and protest in front of the Food and Drug Administration in Washington, D.C., and I was asked to go there and be a speaker at the event with them. And I said yes initially when they asked me when I was out in San Francisco, and uh, this past week when they called again and said, uh, we want to confirm your appearance in Washington, D.C., Today I had to decline forgetting, of course, uh, or remembering at the time, that today was the day we were going to have the big WFTL night at Brothers Deli. So you can call now to make reservations, 968-5881. All I can say, ladies and gentlemen, if I gave up going to Washington, D.C., and making a speech on medical marijuana for this, then you can uh, be there too. So it's Brothers Deli, 1325 South Powerline Road in Pompano Beach, 968-5881. We started off the show on a Miami Dolphins kind of note. I talked about the Dave Hyde column in the Sun Sentinel today. In case you're just waking up, it's one of those must-read columns. David Hyde has been on target this past week, first with Goldberg's column and now with this one. And column essentially asks, why is it that the Orange Bowl continues to have more lore and uh, attraction than Joe Robbie Stadium? which uh, now six years old features the Miami Dolphins in a home opener at four o'clock when the heat is not all that strong and there are eighteen thousand empty seats in the stadium that's the question there are very few teams that have empty seats at a home opener in football when there are only seven or eight dates a year the question is why were there eighteen thousand plus empty seats at Joe Robbie Stadium, what is it about the stadium that is uh, non-alluring to people? Is it too antiseptic, too suburban, too nice, too clean, not dirty enough to fit into the uh, realm of an old kind of ballpark style? Dave Hyde calls it state-of-the-art versus the heart. The Orange Bowl is the heart. Joe Robbie is state-of-the-art. I'll tell you what I hate most about the Orange Bowl was parking in people's yards. What I hate most about Joe Robbie Stadium, aside from the University Drive traffic to and from the stadium, what I hate most is when you're sitting in your seats and you look up at the scoreboard, uh, 56 out of 60 minutes, there is a, a television commercial for Channel 10 or Toyota or Bush Beer, and whenever they broadcast the commercial, and tell me if this isn't true and you haven't noticed this, whenever they broadcast said commercial on the monitors at Joe Robbie Stadium, they increase the sound dramatically. The decibel level of the commercial soars so as to invade the private province of your uh, earwaves. Unless you're wearing one of those headsets to hear Rick Weaver. And Jim, it's the Cleveland Browns, not Rams, Mandich, uh, do the game. Good morning. Let's go to Mendel on line four. Good morning, Norman. I have some thoughts on the uh, lack of uh, size of the crowd at the, the stadium. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, I think looking at the, the, the metropolitan Miami and Fort Lauderdale area, you don't have the population that even Buffalo has or Denver has that you, down here that they have up there to fill the stadium week after week. I also feel that 73,000 seating is larger than most. I'm not sure, but I think it's larger than most of the stadiums. Um, plus the fact it's about 100 bucks a couple to go to a game. I think it's an awful lot of money. 
Actually, we had talked about that about a year ago. I was talking about the cost of the Miami Dolphin games. Well, they're, they're, but, the but how do you explain the fact that the uh, Orange Bowl gets filled up for the Hurricane games? Well, how many how many seats are in the Hurricane? Game? How many seats in the Orange Bowl? Oh, there's a lot more in the Orange Bowl than there are in Joe Robbie. Um, right, but I don't think that the bottom uh, line the bottom line is that uh, if you go and look at the attendance on Saturday. At the Orange Bowl, it was 74,292. At Joe Robbie, it was 55,945. Well, you're true, and the only reason I guess I could attribute to that would be the, the cost involved is not nearly as much, I would think. And also, you have a whole lot more students and alumni and visiting teams that bring in fans than you do have to draw from here in, Mar in Miami. I don't think that... Uh, and also the, 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 the side issue of Miami not being taken seriously because of the sun and fun aspect of South Florida is just not being taken seriously as a major league sports team venue. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my opinion. Take care, Norm. That's my opinion, Bye -bye. says Mendel. Thank you. 7.15 a.m. on WFTL. Brian, let's hear that new Rebel Yelp spot I did. Do you have that one anywhere? I'd like to hear it. I did this spot with the help of my... No. That's the question. Can Norm Kent do George Bush like uh, Jack Cole can up there at the bigger dial? Conventional wisdom says I'm in waist-deep doo-doo. Hypertension city. Gotta unleash some bombs on Sodom to get this election thing going again. Hi, everybody. Norm Kent here, 20 after 7 on WFTL. Let's go to line one and the uh, spontaneous caller. Good morning. Uh, How'd I do? I'll tell you why I don't go to football. Uh, I'm talking about the attendance at Joe Robbie Stadium. Okay. Or at the Orange Bowl. I'll tell you, um, in the last couple of years, uh, athletics to me sucks. Uh, they, Ooh, devastating comment. When they could pay a million, a million dollars uh, or hundreds of thousands of dollars for some some illiterate idiot to run around with a football or basketball or a tennis racket and they're running ads in the engineering times okay for phds for thirty thousand because they could get them in from russia for fifteen i mean so you're just jealous there's something drastically wrong in this in this country uh or, or world i should say when we when we are uh, when we allow this this kind of salary like i wouldn't pay a hundred dollars to go to any of the stadiums to watch any football player but they have to charge this to make up the money for what they're paying uh, uh the last time i went to the orange bowl i had was two years ago my car got nicked up uh some kids jumped all over my roof uh in a traffic jam the policeman sat there doing absolutely nothing and i thought to myself this is absolutely absurd. Uh, so uh, I don't care what they charge or how little they charge. I wouldn't go to a football game or a basketball game. Uh, if it's not on television, forget it. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Well, that's plenty. That's uh, a man who seems to be dissatisfied with life as we know it. A man who has uh, hung up the phone after speaking. Kind of a uh, monologue, a soliloquy, and as soon as he got finished, time to hang up the phone. Well, let me share the phone numbers with you, because we have a couple of open lines now. At 733-1400 in Broward, 1-800-874-3454 in Dade, Monroe, Palm Beach, and just about anywhere else. And star 385 on your Bell South mobility line. A couple of issues that we've been touching on since 6 a.m. Who do you think the greatest athlete in the world ever was? Or is? What do you think of the Orange Bowl compared to JRS? Uh, can you match what Dave Hyde said in the Sun Sentinel today? And does anybody really give a damn about H. Ross Shamo anymore, whether or not he runs, and will he affect anybody on the ballot? So we're kind of uh, ambiently moving from place to place here on WFTL 1400 AM. We've got to do as much sports as we can between now and Wednesday when Jimmy Cephalo gets on QAM and makes his debut. Now, the funny thing about this is... Jimmy Cephalo, he might be good with a script and teleprompter in front of him. I don't know yet whether 
or not, he's going to be able to do four uninterrupted hours of uh, sports talk on QAM. But I look forward to him because he's a fun guy, a very pleasurable, personable, personable, yeah, personable, bull, bull, personable, bull, bull person. Let's go to Mitch on line four. Good morning, Tom. How are you doing? Fine. Just a couple of reasons why I don't think people go to the, uh, the a lot of people don't show the, the games. Number one, down here you, uh, you have a lot of people from all over the United States. So when they come down from New York or from Chicago, you know, their home team is the Chicago Bears, the New York Jets, the Giants. So they don't have allegiance to the Miami Dolphins. Uh, another reason is that up in, let's say, Green Bay or Chicago, again, in, uh, in the colder areas, there's nothing else to do in the wintertime but go to a ball game. Down here you have, you know, golf, tennis, the beaches. So that, I think that's a, a big reason why, uh, you know, you can't get that, that many people to show up at a sporting event in Florida. Do you like uh, college or pro sports? I like pro sports. Pro sports. You hear about this American Amalgamated Football Prediction League of North America? Never heard of it. Well, commercial artist Jack Miller is commissioner of this 137-member league, which has been operating secretly in Fort Lauderdale for 34 years. It's a bunch of guys trying to predict the winners of 250 college football games each year. And the winner gets his name on a trophy, nothing more. And we have secretly learned that amongst the players of this amalgamated football prediction league are Leonce Picot, George Crolius, former uh, the PIO, the Public Information Officer of the Broward Sheriff's Office, Bill Thies, the man from uh, GLAD, and uh, the Old Town Chop House owner, Wally Brewer. How about that? Sensational. A secret football league going on in our city. And I bet you all those guys go to the games. That's kept secret. So you think the reason is because nobody is uh, indigenous to South Florida? A lot of, not enough people are. But what happens when you get a team in from other parts of the country? His allegiance is to see the Giants and the Jets. So if they show up down here, that's when a game will fill up. Now, where are you from? Excuse me? Where are you from? I'm from New York, Long Island. When did you come to South Florida? Uh, five years ago. And from uh, what part of the island did you come, my uh, Long Island, Great Neck. Now, when you come down here, well, let me let me back up first. Were you uh, a fan of the Jets or the Giants in New York? Yes, I was. And I'm just turning now for the Dolphins. Which team? Which team? Uh, the Jets. Okay. So are, are you now shedding your green and white for the blue and orange? Yes, I am. But it took you a while to do it? It did. And that's why this year I'll, you know, I'll become a Marlins fan. I'll wean myself off the Jets immediately. Mm, well, I, the Marlins and Jets are in different leagues. I'm sorry, the Mets. The Mets. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to see you're working your way into the uh, stadium you now. Are, are you saying that uh, what will happen ultimately is that when the Jets come to town, you'll look forward to playing uh, them more than any other team? Uh, Jets or the Giants, you know, just being an ex-New Yorker. But Jets, yeah, I, you know, but, but I'm going to start going to uh, Miami Dolphin games. Well, I have to tell you that I came down here, I guess it was 1976. So I've been here amazingly. Uh, it's almost like being a native when you can say sure. that you have been in South Florida 16 years, as I have. And it took me quite a bit to uh, not root for the Jets, who used to train at Hofstra University. Right. Many of whom, oh, they still do, actually. Many of whom I knew from my sports reporting days. Uh, when the Dolphins first came down here, I used to root for the Jets all the time. And now I am uh, totally devoted to the Dolphins, although there is a secret voice inside of me, because Joe Robbie pissed me off so many times, that when they lose, I, I mean, I have to admit this, I should probably get uh, Dr. Samick, you know, Steve's psychiatrist on here to admit this to me, but for a couple of years, when the Dolphins lost, I didn't feel that bad, because I felt it was a slap in the face of Joe Robbie for not signing the right players. See, I'm also one of the guys that thinks Don Shula... If he got fired, it wouldn't all be be all that bad. Well, I have to think, by the way, when the Marlins come here, it's also going to help the Dolphins because they took out X amount of seats, so that might be make it easier to fill up the, uh, you know, Joe Robbie for the football games. Well, I think they put him back when the Dolphins play. I think they know the certain seats they couldn't put back. All right, we'll see. All right, let's go to Bill on line one. Be good. Norm. Yes. How are you doing today? Okay. I think everybody's missing the point. Uh oh. I, I just don't think it's a stadium. I just. Uh, I just think it's the type of crowd you get at hurricane games. I think more people are just would rather
rather see a good college game than a pro game because the pro game is boring. I just, uh, I went to the Miami Florida A&M game, okay, a game that shouldn't draw, you know. Yeah, I mean, everybody knew that the Hurricanes were going to romp, that FAMU would be a joke, and yet 75,000 people... There had to be more than that there, because, uh, did you go to the game? Not the Hurricane game, no. The aisles, you couldn't even walk up and down the aisles. I've never seen it, I've never seen Orange Bowl that crowded. I've gone... Every hurricane game probably for 20 years. Was it because... Uh, how was the newness of the stadium? You know, the resurrection of the Orange Bowl. No, it's still the same Orange Bowl. They got these little contoured seats that are just as uncomfortable as the benches you sit on. So that's, you know, the Orange Bowl, Joe Robbie. If the, the Hurricanes play at Joe Robbie Stadium, you will be able to hear yourself thinking there. I think it's, the crowd is younger. I think the... What I see at the crowds at Joe Robbie's, I don't go to all the Dolphin games. I go to a few of them. That's the key, I think. You just said it. The crowd is younger. Yeah, because they just seem more older and conservative. It's just, it's just a different type of crowd. You see, when you have a stadium with 51,000 season ticket holders and the season tickets are as expensive as $25 a pop, what you're going to have is a more affluent suburban middle-class crowd. Even, even, and that's what you have at Joe Robbie Stadium. You have fifty-one thousand season ticket holders, so they tend to be more affluent. And if they tend to be more affluent, they are more conservative in their demeanor. You know, there's fathers going with their sons. It's not like college students going there and uh, getting drunk. Well, the reserve seats at uh, the Orange Bowl for the Hurricane games are twenty bucks, so it's not that they're cheap. And the end zone are fourteen, so there's not all that many end zone seats. So it's you're not even talking about that much difference in money. Shooting down one more theory I have. Yeah, I just uh, I just think that Hurricanes play a much more exciting brand of football and they don't make $5 million a year to go out and run off the field when someone intercepts a pass of yours and, you know, you don't make the tackle. I just think people just, you know, I just think the money situation has got out of line with them and just it's much more fun to watch Lamar Thomas run around, pull his helmet off after he catches a touchdown pass or the players going to the stands and high-fiving the fans, you know, when they make a catch. It's just altogether different. The fans are into the game. And I just, you know, I just think... That, that's definitely true. The fans are into the game, clearly. Yeah, I mean, you remember when Michael Irvin would catch a pass, he'd go high-five the fans. And right. The fans. And the other guys do it. And Well, he caught some for Dallas yesterday. He sure did. Tell you, Troy Aikman and he combined for a certain victory for Dallas. I'll tell you something else they do. Um, you know, down in the uh, end zone where they have the handicap seating? Yeah. About five or six players after every game go down there and shake hands with the people in that end for coming to the game because they know how hard it is for them to get there. And just so many things. You know, you hear so many bad things about Miami and you see these things. And it's even the work they did at the... That's another thing. You watch what your Miami players did during the hurricane down in Homestead. They were moving trees. The Dolphin players are handing out hats and T-shirts from the back of a, you know, a truck. All right, I get the picture. But, I, you know, I just, uh, I just think it's, it's just not the people are just not... I think you touched upon one of the key things. You said age, the age difference. I, I, I definitely think so. Definitely. Listen, when you were in college and you went to a fraternity party and then a football game, it was uh, beer, booze, and broads all the way and the rowdiness at the park. And I if you go to a game with your family at Joe Robbie Stadium, you know, you come home in the station wagon and you make a dinner on a charcoal grill. Exactly. Different attitude, different atmosphere. Definitely. Okay, Norman. Which way do you like it more? Are you sorry you ever grew up? That's the question. Exactly. <laughs> I think you hit it right there. <laughs> give me, give me, give me the seats with my college frat uh, any day over the club seats. Yeah, and, and you know the women are much better looked at at the uh, hurricane games. Also, there's a there you go. A lot less makeup, huh? Oh yeah. Okay. A lot, a lot less clothes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Norman. All right. Good talk. I, actually, I remember one of my gay friends, Bob. He said that whenever he used to go, whenever <laughs> this is a true story, he'd always like it when there was a college football game because of all the young guys that would come to town. Let's go to uh, Bill. No, uh, this is Jerry. Jerry, sorry. How are you doing, Norm? All right. Uh, I think uh, I go to Hurricane games. I've been going season ticket holder for 20 years, and um, it's definitely 
the excitement. I, I went there when they were losing, when, it, when you had 12,000, 15,000 people in the stands and you couldn't draw anybody. Remember those days when you couldn't give away seats to Hurricane games? It, was, it seems it wasn't that far away. I used to, I remember we played East Carolina State with 12,000 people in the fan. I, it was unbelievable, but I think what happens is that as Miami got better, and this this South Florida uh, fans always support a winner, never support a loser. That uh, as the Hurricanes got better, more and more people went to Hurricane games. It was a matter of dollars. You couldn't, you really can't afford. Uh, most people can't afford to go to both games in the same weekend. And if you're t- talking twenty dollars for Hurricanes and twenty dollars for Dolphins just for the ticket, plus the extras, it's you know for uh, a father to bring his son, it's one hundred fifty dollars for the weekend. And so it's a matter of priority. Where are you going to get more entertainment dollar? And I think people are more are finding it with the Hurricanes. It's, uh, it's a great uh, atmosphere. And uh, I think, I mean, in my section, where I've seen the same people have been sitting with me for 20 years. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of students that, of, of the 74,000 people who were there, you may have had 10,000 students. And um, really, are you uh, out of seventy-four thousand, only ten thousand students? I would think. I mean, I they had that's one. certainly not. When you see a ball game on TV, a Tennessee game or something, well, that's well, all. I went to University of, and half the stadium in Florida is students. But uh, that is, you know, college town. There's nothing else to do that weekend. And I think the total enrollment at Miami is only eight thousand students. The total enrollment. And uh, I wouldn't think that every one of them would go to a game. So either it's adults fantasizing that they're still kids. No, I think it's adults just enjoying a good football game. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot of alumni to continue to uh, support the team, and more so now than before because they're winning. But um, it's just uh, it's a great atmosphere, and uh, it's changed a lot. I mean, years ago there, there were a lot of fights in the stands that I could see from my uh, seat, but I haven't seen one in years. And... Uh, it's uh, it's just great entertainment. It's, uh, it's it's a wonderful atmosphere. I think a, a gentleman in the Herald I read yesterday or the day before, comparing the two, really put it uh, succinctly, saying, going to Miami, uh, he goes to both Dolphins and Hurricanes. Going to a Hurricane game, I uh, root for uh, football. Going to a Dolphin game, I pass out my business card. That says it well, doesn't it? I, Listen, you've got to read Dave Hyde's column in today's Sun Sentinel. I've got the Sentinel. I'll be reading it when I get yeah. to the office. Let me know what you think of his column. He says it's uh, like uh, the Orange Bowl has heart and Miami is state of the art. We've got to take a break. I'm five minutes over because of your call. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, we'll see you. Bye-bye. We talk to you, AM 14, WFTL. AM, what is it about the... Orange Bowl that makes it so much more lovable than Joe Robbie Stadium. Let's go to Peter on line four. Hi, how you doing? Okay. All right. The, the way I see it, when I came down here in 83, uh, I used to go to the Orange Bowl to see the Dolphins play, and I used to hear all the crying and complaining that the seats had no backs, there were no, no place to park, you had to park in somebody's driveway, uh, I heard all the all the uh, all the complaints. The bathrooms weren't good. I guess Joe Robbie heard those complaints for many years too. So what he did is he went out and he built a beautiful stadium. And I believe that the people down here are just unappreciative of uh, of professional football, and they are front runners. I think because because the Canes are winning and the Canes are uh, you know national champions year after year, and they're in the running all the time. That this is where it's at. The people are front runners, and. Uh, you know, I'm sure Joe Robbie heard all those complaints, and he tried to do something uh, something better. I love the stadium. I go to I go I have, I'm a season ticket holder. I go to the game. I enjoy it. Dolphins good. Dolphins give you a good game. You know, they got a lot of problems. You know, they they have a lot of work to do, but I enjoy the games. And uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a beautiful place to watch a game. So you have no complaints about Joe Robbie then? I have absolutely no complaints. At the beginning, it was the the parking problem. You know, when you went to Joe Robbie, but they got that all taken care of. Uh, the traffic and all that. But you, no matter where you go, you're going to have traffic if you have all, you have all these cars uh, trying to leave at the same time or get in at the same time. You know, no matter where. I used to go to Shea Stadium in New York, and believe me, there was no cigar getting in there. It was. Uh, it was as much of a problem and more of a problem than it is going into Joe Robbie. But the people just the people down here there's something about them when it comes to sports and I, I'm I'm I I can only compare it to football, it's just that just not appreciative of the kind of team that they have and the coach and 
and the great stadium that they have. They're just not great fans. They're not, they're not what, in my opinion, is real fans. So you like Don Shula as a coach? I like Don Shula as a coach. Well, what's not to like about Don Shula? The guy got 300, over 300 victories. He's a sportsman. Has his time passed him by? Is he... No time passed him by. That's such baloney. I've never heard anything so... Such baloney? That's such baloney. His time has passed him by? I don't know. The kind of draft selections that he makes, the family value steam that he has. Well, he's... You know, rather than having a 350-pound guy named Bubba who kicks ass, he wants to pick some uh, college graduate from Cleveland with the philosophy of morals degree, an Eric Kumaro type. Super Bowl more than the Dolphins. The Dolphins have been to the Super Bowl six times. How many other teams have been to the Super Bowl six times? What have you done for me lately, though? What has he done? For when was the last time 80, they were in the we were playoffs? In the Bowl. In 85, we were in the Super Bowl. When was the last time uh, Seattle was in the Super Bowl? They've never been to the Super Bowl. How many, how many times? There's a rule against teams. The Eagles. There's a rule against teams from Seattle finishing in the uh, first division in any sport, whether it's baseball or uh, hockey or basketball or football. The, the fans, Did you know that? It's a special rule. The fans down here are, are spoiled because the Dolphins always go to the Super Bowl. Always. They always well, six, six times. Remember, the Dolphins came in existence in 1966, and in 1972 they had an unbeaten season. I mean, you know, think about it. So the team, they, they feel that what's going to happen is that they have to be perfect all the time. Well, you go to look at the New York Giants. Gary, what does this say for the uh, Marlins on their way to town? What do I feel? I, first of all, I have season tickets for the Marlins, too. Where are your seats? Uh, in section 155. Oh, no. What row? Uh, 18. Oh, goodness. Thank God you're 15 rows behind me. Are uh, you in the uh, founder's seats? Unfortunately, I am, Gary. Well, that's because you're a very wealthy lawyer, you know, and I'm just a, I'm just a poor boy working 18 hours a day. Well, just stay away from me, okay? <laughs> We're in the same section. Just stay I, the hell away. Oh, I know what you look like, okay? And I'm going to bust your chops every time I see you. All right. We'll see you. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. All right. Section 155 is a great section, though. Yeah, it is. Between first and uh, uh, third and... Third and home. Home. Nice try. Between All right. Thir between third and first. Somewhere between third and first. No, third 17 minutes to 8 a.m. Norman, I got a theory about why people go to the Orange Bowl and don't go to Joe Robbie Stadium. Why the hell would you want... Why, uh, and why the hell would you want to support a loser? You know, the, you... It, Everyone, the one that everyone tr always tries out is uh, is the Saints. The poor old Saints gets their butts kicked every year, but they still sell out every game. But look at them. They're all 912 years old. None of them are worth a damn. I mean, they're doing a pretty good job for for them. We've got some of the best players in the league and can't, man and, and, and can't manage to scrape through the Super Bowl. Hey, listen, I've said that year after year since 1986. Don Shula should be held to task. We are like... The uh, Montreal Expos not winning in the early 80s, like Cincinnati not winning in the late 80s. You've got the greatest quarterback in the history of the game, perhaps, in Dan Marino quarterbacking your team. Sure. You've got Clayton and Duper, some of the most phenomenal receivers football will ever record at the... Uh, you know, receiver lines. You've got Reggie Roby, one of the best punters the NFL has ever seen, kicking for you. You've got Pete Stojanovic getting an 85 to 90 percent mark on field goals, and yet we have a defense that's as porous as a... Uh, I don't know, just think of an analogy. But you know what's worse about everything the Dolphins do? which frustrates the hell out of me, is we play this prevent defense, which prevents nothing. You know what was so funny? Watching David Shula learn from his dad and watching Cincinnati yesterday blow their first game of the year because they went to that prevent defense with two minutes left. Well, isn't, isn't it prevents nothing. I don't know where the hell they came up with that. No, it does prevent. It prevents the team that uses it from winning. It does. It prevents them from winning. You, you, know, know, you know what else? To lose year after year after year with some of the best players in the league. That's got, and I know it's blasphemy, and people get nuts when you say it. They should have fired Shula years ago. Well, I said it last year, and I'll say it again this year. They should have fired him. I know it's unpopular. I know it's gutsy to say it, but I don't like the way Shula coaches anymore. I don't like the... Look, he's had sole control of this team right down to the draft picks. Uh -huh. And I don't like the selections he's made or the trades he's made or the people he's acquired and the people he's kept. Frankly, you know what I think it is? Do you remember years and years and years ago when one of the best uh, college coaches in the country was Frank Broyles? Yeah. 
Well, pretty soon he started getting too many irons in the fire. He had business over here and a business over there, and he was doing ads here and had too many things going on, and pretty soon he just he just fell to hell. That's right, Don Schuler. If he's not at his steakhouse, he does his golf course. They screwed up, and they, they fired him but made him the athletic director, and Arkansas hasn't had a football team since. But but it's they need to dump this guy. You know, I mean, there are too many good coaches out there to keep keep dragging his dead carcass along. All right, it's a quarter to eight. The Dolphins are two and zero, oh, and somebody says, "Let's get rid of Don Shula's dead carcass." We'll be back in just a second. Florida's talk leader, AM fourteen WFTL. 881, there are still a few reservations left. Brothers Deli in Pompano, 968-5881. AM 14, WFTL, and more with Storm and Norman Kent. Okay, we're back with you at about uh, 12 minutes to 8 a.m. The lines are open at the moment, 733-1400 in Broward, 1-800-874. 3454 in Dade and Palm Beach. And of course, if you're in your car, star 385 on your Bell South mobility line. 75,000 people traveled to the Orange Bowl on Saturday to watch the Hurricanes clobber FAMU in a anticipated victory. 18,000 no shows yesterday at Joe Robbie, though, where the Dolphins went to a 2 0 record. Despite Rick Weaver and Jim Mandich announcing the game, I'll tell you, uh, listening to the beginning parts of the game on radio from West Palm Beach, I missed Hank Goldberg right away. Jim Mandich came on the air and announced that the Dolphins were playing the Cleveland Rams. Talk about giving a football game color. Anyway, the... Uh, Last caller opened up a Pandora's box by mentioning the Marlins. I have uh, steadfastly not done anything particular on the Marlins. I did point out that they have announced they are going to move their new home opener on April 5, 1993, to a day game so as not to conflict with Passover. Passover falls on the evening of... Uh, April 5th, and that's when the game was scheduled. I don't anticipate, ladies and gentlemen, that there will be an opening game on April 5th. You have my word as a, a sports authority that there will be a lockout come next April, and a lockout will essentially mean that nobody will be playing ball. That is why the owners fired Faye Vincent and replaced him with Bud Selig representing the executive committee of owners because they want to take a firm, ardent, and adamant stand, they do most assuredly, uh, against the ball players who make millions and millions of dollars. They want to put an end to arbitration, which has caused salaries to skyrocket. And one of the callers suggested that the reason the Dolphins are not so popular is that it is becoming harder and more difficult to cheer athletes who are making uh, millions and zillions and billions of dollars a year to catch a football. By the way, this prediction I am making about the lockout next spring, which uh, could mean a silent spring and summer, um, maybe the whole season is not something I am saying uniquely. The uh, column that Newsweek had on September 21st featured George Will's thoughts on this issue as well. Now, George Will just wrote an outstanding, very meticulous book on baseball entitled Men at Work, and he has always been an outstanding baseball fan. He, too, has predicted that the owners will do in 1993 what they did in 1990, simply lock out the players. Now, in 1990, opening day was merely delayed. But the owners' aims were considerably less aggressively ambitious than they now are. And therefore, when you combine the new aggressiveness of the owners with the forethought they had by firing the commissioner, you are looking at the Major League Baseball Players Association, the union, 
doing battle with the executive committee. Now, I must warn you that the reason this strike can go on as long as I suspect it will is because the union has upwards of $100 million as an emergency fund from licensing revenues of baseball cards and lots of other stuff from the uh, little coffee cups you drink every morning with your team logo on it to the hats that you wear with their logo on it. Um, you combine that with the fact that the owners have lost every legal battle with the players over the last 15 or 20 years, and you can see that the union can't afford a strike. Combine that with the next television contract being half of what it was when CBS paid uh, Major League Baseball $65 million, and you have an industry on the verge of ruin. You have the price of players set in a national market, but team owners who are trying to usurp those rights, that are trying to prevent player mobility, uh, end arbitration, and limit free agency. What baseball needs more than anything else, and I should wrap this up by saying it needs a new constitution more than anything else, and it needs a government in which people, both the employers and owners recognize, the employees and owners recognize they have a mutuality and commonality of interest. We don't have that now, and I see that baseball is moving towards one of its uh, worst situations ever in 1993. <laughs> I only say that because I want to know if anybody out there is pissed off about the Marlins seats they got for next year. You know, there's been a lot of flack in the newspaper. There was an editorial last week in the news about it, about how the uh, Marlins glitches left a lot of people suspicious. Tom Jick is screaming about it. What do you think? All right, let's go to some of our calls. It's five minutes to eight. We'll start off with Tom. Hey, Norm, how are you doing this morning? Okay. Uh, I don't mean to change your subject. You don't, but you're going to. I'm going to. Well, maybe you are. Well, you're going to try to, perhaps. I think you'd be interested in this. Newt right. Henrich, who is the chief fundraiser for the Republican Party. Is he the chief fundraiser? Yes, you there? Hello. I'm here. Okay. Uh, it was reported in the Philadelphia Inquirer, I talked to my uncle yesterday, that his daughter has been living a lesbian lifestyle for the last three years. Uh-huh. Well, you know, I've become... <laughs> this is our daily uh, gay revelation in the uh, Republican Party segment, I think. Well, it seems to be... At 7.55 a.m. every day, we'll have somebody out, another gay Republican. Well, it seems to be happening across the board with the Republican Party. For some reason, they keep <laughs> preaching this lifestyle that we should be living and how our family should be doing, but everybody seems to be coming out of the closet. Well, we have uh, the chief fundraiser for Mr. Bush, uh, Newt Gingrich's daughter. Is that... What you said, his daughter's a lesbian? Daughter, that's what was reported in the Philadelphia Inquirer yesterday. The Philadelphia Inquirer says it. And, of course, uh, last week, Phyllis Shafley's son admitted that he was homosexual. And the week before that, uh, Mr. Mossbacher of the National Security Agency, uh, Bush's right-hand man in the Pentagon, apparently said that his daughter was a lesbian. So what you're learning and discovering is that uh, the family values of the Republicans have uh, alienated a lot of their kids, I guess. Well, I guess so. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say about it other than, you know, you don't, apparently they don't practice what they preach. <laughs> well, listen, they can't control their kids' lives. Well, they can't control our lives either, which is what they're trying to do. Well, somebody ought to wake them up and tell them that, huh? Well, uh, I hope, uh, what is it, November 5th is Election Day this year? Now, listen, Tom, the important thing here is that the last time I let somebody call in with a revelation about a family member of a political official, like with uh, Bush last week, mm -hmm. Mr. Kane immediately panicked and freaked out, and he wanted me on his show to explain that I was gloating. I am not, I am not gloating about anything. Well, I'm not gloating either. You're just pointing out that these people that espouse family values uh, want to control the rest of the world, but they can't even control their own kids. Yeah, well, before Mr. Kane worries about what, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, I guess if he's going to get out and vote, he should worry about going to the courthouse and registering. Right. Well, listen, just in time, Chronic Steve from Cooper City's on line four. Okay. Have, have, have good fun with All right. I can't believe I'm going to go back to doing the show I'm doing. I don't care about who has gay or lesbian children. But let's go to Chronic Steve anyway. Okie dokie. Have fun. All right.
Chronic Steve from Cooper City. How you doing? Well, that was a real interesting call. Very important. I mean, major news. By the way, did you... Well, I'm sorry we can't uh, play trivia. I'm sorry we can't play Trivial Pursuit all day like you would do, but... Oh, that's uh, all right. I just wanted, in the spirit of the show, to uh, call in. I don't know if you read the uh, story in the New York Post, but it's come out that Bill Clinton's mother uh, lives with a woman and is bisexual. I just wanted to get that out on the record, because this is your factual show here. Well, listen, did you read this one in the Globe? The what? Did you read this one in the well, Globe? This was the uh, New York Post. Okay, well, there's another, you know, that, the, New York Post has a lot, the New York Post has a lot in common with the Los Angeles Times. The Los Angeles Times, of course, is like the West Coast Enquirer. Well, so either way, I just That's want to get all the facts out, because, you know, I, I wouldn't want a station that was given to, uh, you know, rumor-mongering and unsubstantiated things, so... Except between, I mean, except between just, 9 and 12, right? We're just going to balance them with equally imaginative stories, all right? All right, except between 9 and 12, then rumor-mongering is fine. That's correct. Okay. Okay, because uh, the last I heard, Rick and Suds was still on WIOD. Oh, no, they'll be there for a month or two. Isn't that what you said last year? Okay. Have a great day, Mr. Yeah, bye -bye. Steve. Bye-bye. Chronic Steve from Cooper City calling in in desperation, recognizing that his candidate fleeing a debate is also flopping in the electoral polls and is uh, destined and doomed to failure on November 3rd. Anyway, we have been talking about whether or not you have more fun at the Orange Bowl with the Canes than at JRS with the Dolphin Suburbanites. Let me know when we come back. Talk to us, AM 14, WFTL, Fort Lauderdale. And for Bell South Mobility customers, it's Star FTL. Now on Florida's talk leader, here's Storm and Norman with more Hot Talk. Up in the morning, wake me up with a smile. Storm in with Norman from 6 to 9. Some days it seems he goes out of his mind, but he roots, roots, roots for the morning. So you know he's not bad. Don't catch one, two, three times the fun that you've ever had. Wake me up in the morning. Wake me up with a song. Storming with Norman on FTL. When he hears of injustice, he gives them all hell and he roots. For the right. And the right team is your team, be it the Dolphins or the Marlins, and be it with my dissatisfaction of Don Shula or not, the Dolphins are 2-0 and after scoring early and hanging on to defeat the Rams 26-10 to yesterday at Joe Robbie Stadium, where only 56,000 fans turned out. 74,000 turned out to see the Hurricanes whomp up on FAMU Saturday, and we have been asking this morning why the Orange Bowl is uh, still a little bit more popular than Joe Robbie Stadium, and I turned the question around a little bit when we had people calling in about the Marlins for next year. I made some comments about the fact that there will be no next year in baseball. I seriously expect and anticipate that uh, there's going to be a major strike unless they can hire somebody like my old law school dean, Eric Schmertz, to mediate this labor dispute. Um, question is, is there anybody out there who is, in fact, disenchanted with their Marlin season tickets? Does anybody feel they uh, royally got screwed? Or are most people content? Now, despite what I read in the Sun Sentinel about the dissatisfaction 3,700 people have with the fact that they were moved, and they have some good legal grounds to be upset, I have to say that since they had the Select a Seat Day on September the 12th, the numbers of complaints appear to have diminished, and most of all, since only 1,000 people actually went out to look at their seats, and there were 16,000 season seats sold, you have to raise the question whether or not most people weren't already happy. But equally concerning attention is the fact that a lot of people who asked for seats in specific sections of the park, when they were not given those seats, were given others that they did not want. And you know, if you were going to buy a leather couch that was maroon for your living room and it cost $4,000 and you ordered that couch and six months later you got a call that your couch was now in and you came and picked it up and it was a beige felt couch, but they said, don't worry, 
uh, even though it's a foot smaller and not the color you want and not the material you want, we're selling it for you less than you anticipated paying, why I still think you would be entitled not to have paid any money and get your full refund back. And I suspect the Marlins will be in that situation with those people they put into outfield reserve seats and chose box. Of course, the lever they have over their head is they will tell those people that the people that cancel out their box seats in the second and third year, well, the first crack at those people's seats will go to those who accepted infield reserve but were initially paying for box. Do you follow what I mean? If you're one of the 3,300 who got bumped into the reserve section or outfield sections that are not uh, seasoned boxes, but you're now like what they call terrorist boxes, well, if you just hold on to your seats, you'll be the first ones to move up when people drop out. And we'll find out on November 15th what kind of uh, team we have when guys like uh, Tony Phillips and Andre Dawson get drafted. But we'll see. It's 10 minutes after 8. I do have to respond to an inquiry Mr. Kane made. Tom got us off the track when he pointed out that a recent revelation in the newspaper said that uh, Newt Gingrich's daughter was living a lesbian lifestyle. And Mr. Kane immediately called in Chronic Steve from Cooper City to announce that he has uh, information from the New York Post that Bill Clinton's mother is living with another woman, thereby implying that maybe she's a lesbian. Now, you see what the limited mindset of the Republican Steve Kane does not realize. Mr. Kane, who, by the way, is not registered to vote. <laughs> It's amazing that we are even letting him comment on the election. You know, he should be instead talking about his daughter's soccer tournament or doing another Trivial Pursuit show, or perhaps he can play with the urine lady on another show. Or maybe there's a UFO show Steve can do, because obviously, uh, what credibility can you place in an individual who uh, hasn't even bothered to register to vote in the home he's had for the last two years, really? I mean, it's almost insulting, it's uh, denigrating. Here's a man who uh, bitched and bitched and cried and cried after Nick Navarro lost the election that people didn't know about the election because they were distracted by the hurricane and couldn't vote. But when I tried to do some political programming prior to the election, he tried to uh, shout me down and turn off the mic and ignore it. So, Mr. Kane, the difference between Bill Clinton's mother living with another woman, if that's the case, and Newt Gingrich's daughter doing that is that Bill Clinton has nothing to be ashamed of because when it comes to the issue of gay and lesbian rights, Bill Clinton has wholeheartedly endorsed those views. You see, if Bill Clinton's daughter decided that upon her turning 17 or 18, she wanted an abortion, it would not embarrass Bill Clinton because Bill Clinton has been for a woman's right to choose. Unfortunately, it is only embarrassing to those people that are saying they are righteous Republicans and there's a particular way you have to live your life, and it's our way that it becomes embarrassing and humiliating if their daughter or child turns out not to live up to their high standards. But, Mr. Kane, I don't expect you to understand that because that requires a level of comprehension incompatible with one who at 8 o'clock a.m., 8 o'clock a.m., is probably still a bit halcyon-induced. So why don't you go chat with the governor and all his yahoos who are probably walking around Homestead saying, you mean this is our state? Anyway, it's about 8.13 a.m. Let me tell you a little bit right now, if I could, about my friends F. Brothers Deli and Pompano, 968-5881. Now back to Storm and Norman on Florida's talk leader, AM 14, WFTM. Oh, am I looking forward to that juicy Romanian tenderloin steak this evening at Brothers with the large size steak fries they have and some potato pancakes with applesauce and their chicken noodle soup and cheesecake dessert as well as the coleslaw and salad and pickles they put out on your table. All for ten ninety five and the opportunity to get to debate Steve Kane and Rick Seidemann in public. It will be exciting. Twenty minutes after eight, as will be the uh, post 
Brothers festivities at the Northridge Raw Bar, where the Chicago Bears will probably uh, wipe up the field with the New York Giants. The Giants and Jets suffering as they are from uh, lousy coaches. Coslett stinks with the Jets and uh, Hanley's history with the Giants. Just want to say that. Bring back Bill Parcells right away. 20 minutes after 8 a.m. on this Monday morning, do you think that the Orange Bowl has a life and heart that Joe Robbie doesn't? It's not the first column that's been written about it, but Dave Hyde has a Scorcher today calls it a hot versus state of the art. 18,000 people don't show up to the home opener for the Dolphins against the Los Angeles Rams, and uh, probably the ones that showed up were late because of the traffic on University Drive. And uh, I've also asked the question, has anybody out there been upset with the fact that their Marlins tickets suck, but nobody's complained at all, which leads me to believe that the uh, grievances and gripes are few and far between. Separate and apart from that, H. Ross Chameau is talking about getting in the race. Does anybody care? Will anybody vote for him? I certainly don't think so. He's got the reputation as a quitter, and now he's a quacker. He says the only one way that he can get his economic message out is if he takes out advertising on TV and they won't sell him ads. They'll sell him ads, they just won't sell it to him at the price that a candidate pays unless he announces his candidacy. So he says he's going to have to announce his candidacy in order to get rates low. I mean, is he jerking us around or what? Yeah, I'm sure. You know what H. Ross Perot's secret plan for the economy is? Sure, it's the same one that Richard Nixon had in 1968 when he said he was going to end the Vietnam War. He had a secret plan to end the Vietnam War, and he did. He gave us a secret plan to end the Vietnam War. What he didn't tell us that the secret plan was that he's going to get elected president, become a crook, get impeached, get his ass thrown out, and then the war would end. Just took six years for us to figure it out. And you know what? While only 49 lawyers and politicians and heads of state were indicted during the Nixon administration. There's been over a hundred Reagan and Bush appointees that have been indicted, charged, and convicted since they started their tenure in 1980. And I'm not just talking about Casper Weinberger, but now they're talking about uh, Special Prosecutor Walsh looking into George Shultz. So I think that what it is, it's, it's a ticket to uh, wealth in Eglin Air Force Base to have wound up as a, an administrator in a Republican administration. Ask Sparrow Agnew, the lobbyist for the Arabs, if you don't believe me. 22 minutes after 8 a.m. on this Monday morning, there was another comment that I wanted to make. I saw a bunch of new television shows last week, and once again, the reviews have to be pathetic, poor, and maudlin, and trite, and worthless. The canned laughter and stereotypical programming is nothing new. Each and every fall season, Hollywood brings its mindless tripe upon us, and one has to wonder if Dan Quayle has any common sense at all. It certainly is in his uh, commentary about TV programming. Speaking of which, Murphy Brown's season premiere is tonight. And in her one-hour-long episode, since you'll all be at Brothers, you should tape the episode. In her one-hour-long debut, she takes a number of pot shots at Dan Quayle getting back. In fact, Dan Quayle's getting into the sense of things. Remember when Richard Nixon, running for president, did a feature on uh, what, laughing? He came on the air and he said, sock it to me. Well, Dan Quayle went on KTLA last week and did a promo for the Murphy Brown show. He said that Murphy Brown was his favorite show. Not. So... One has to wonder what Candace Bergen has in store for Mr. Quayle tonight. We will find out. I was not impressed by any of the new sitcoms on TV last week, except for one, typically, with his incredible sense of humor. Bob Newhart has struck it again. This time he plays a comic artist fighting for the integrity of his character, who they uh, want to make into a love muffin and have him uh, smearing his... Uh, you know, ward by the side, you know, doesn't want him to have a ward anymore, they want him to murder him, they want him to become a vicious guy, I don't know, whatever the hell it was, it was funny, but that's because Bob Newhart is such a great comedian. I'm wondering if any of you out there saw a TV show last week that made its season premiere that made you laugh or you thought was going to have any staying power. Or you, like me, are the kind of people that want to wait around a year see which lasts, and then begin watching the show in its second year after you recognize that, gee, maybe it's funny. 
See, there's certain people I don't think were ever that funny, like Bill Cosby. I, I did not know he had a, a successful TV show until about its a tenth season. But there were a whole bunch of new shows on last week, and if there was anything, uh, knock 'em, rock 'em, sock 'em, I'd like to know. Now there were a bunch of people that had told me about this show Grapevine, which was supposedly filmed in Miami. That every time I went to turn it on on a Monday night, I couldn't find it on the screen. So what I'm thinking is that the show debuted in July or August, and it's already been canceled. But we have a whole bunch of new shows like Love and War and Hearts of Fire and Whoops and Flying Blind and the Ben Stiller Show and Great Scott. Is there anything out there that uh, anybody finds particularly amusing other than Queer Talk on FTL Saturday nights? Speaking of Queer Talk, here's the queen of queer. Let's go to Jimmy Ray. Norman, how you doing? How you doing, brother? Good. Listen, hey, did you miss Delta? Uh, I didn't see Delta. I wanted to watch that, but I missed it. Now, uh, what was the story on that? That was on Thursday night. It was on uh, Monday and Thursday. Oh, it was on both days? It was on two days this week. They aired two episodes. I tuned in Monday. This is Delta Burke. Yeah. So I tuned in Monday night because I thought she was going to, like, lay a big egg, and I couldn't believe it. I was, I was enthralled. Enthralled. So I had to go out and get the same color of dye and put it on my hair. And well, let me get this right. Delta dyed her hair, so you dyed yours. Well, it's just the shade of blonde she uses. So I switched. <laughs> you switched because of a TV character? No, because she looks so flawless. Oh, okay. I went, I went from Madonna blonde to Delta blonde. I see. Well, Jimmy, I am sure that Charlie Beto is glad to hear that. Now, he has a very bleach blonde haircut. Did you uh, arrange for him to dye his hair again, too? No, no. Charlie, I asked him about that Saturday night on the air, and uh, he wanted to drop his pants to prove that that was his own color. <laughs> oh, is that right? What makes you think he couldn't bleach his pubic hair? Well, I mean, that and was... what makes you think he didn't want to drop his pants on the air just to see if he could turn you on? Trust me, I... because there isn't anybody left uh, that he does turn on. I did not want to see anything he had. <laughs> well, there's not much you're missing from what I've been told. <laughs> I, can't... I can't believe I'm doing a sports morning show and I'm talking about uh, Charlie Beto's pubic hair on the air. I know. I'm still waiting for Charlie to take me to a Marlins game. Well, Jimmy, they don't start playing till next April. I don't care. And since I predicted a year-long strike, we may not see Marlins baseball until 1994. Well, you know how Charlie gets, so I have to start hitting him. Well, I know what Charlie gets, and I just got to keep on warning him that they're supposed to be over 18. <laughs> really? But, uh... <laughs> Listen, that's why he's eating chicken tonight. Anyways. I hope to see you there. We're going to have a special Queer Talk section for uh, FTL listeners at the Brothers Deli. I'll be there in full regalia with Delta Blonde hair. We'll look forward. I don't know what Delta Blonde means, but all I can tell you, Delta's the airline that used to go, I'm, I'm Bambi, fly me. <laughs> well, was that National Airlines did that? I, I think it was Delta. <laughs> it was either Delta or National that decided to give their planes female names. Well, listen, if you get a chance, watch her, watch her this week. It was great. All right, well, maybe tonight. I'll take. When, what day is the Delta show going to be on? I think it's Monday nights, but last week they did something where they had a, a double uh, episode. A double whammy. Yeah. All right, let me go do my Jerry's Drugs feature. 8-1. It's back to Storm and Norman in the morning on AM 14, WFTL. We have on the lines Terrible Terry and Cranky Claw. Let's go to uh, Terry first, get some thoughts here. Good morning. This is Cranky Clark. Oh, I went to Cranky Clock first? Just goes to show you. Uh, I just want to let you know that that was National Airlines that to come fly me. It was National. National, right. And uh, you know where they went? Yeah. They went everywhere every other airline went with deregulation. Broke and bankrupt after living off government subsidies for years. Well, there again, you know, I, I believe in uh, free enterprise, but I think there's just most of us due to mismanagement. I don't doubt it, the monies they were spending. But you have to realize something, that when the government subsidizes airline fares, we call it subsidies. When we give money to people who are in a depressed economic area to try to uh, lift themselves up by their own bootstraps, we call it welfare. You're right. And it's a crock. It is a lie. It is... How many people do you think in the uh, Harlem ghettos in New York City got on a plane and flew to Laguna Beach for their summer vacations or flew to Kennebunkport 
Maine, well, where right. George Bush did, you see. But the uh, people that are Republican and the Newt Gingriches and Rick Seidemans of the world, not to compare them and say they're on the same stature, they will call it uh, welfare when you give to the and poor. When we give, and we give money overseas, they call it... Uh, uh, Foreign aid. aid. Right. So uh, what I want to say about the new, uh, new programs, uh, I saw one that was pretty funny. It was uh, Home Improvements. Have you mentioned that yet? Oh, that was, uh, isn't that in its second year already? I don't think so, is it? It's the first time I've seen it. Uh -huh. Fox has just picked it up. Oh, well, that's a good one. I think that is. That's a very and popular one, and they put it up right against Cheers or something. There's another one, too, that uh, is more of a serious note, is the round table. That was, they had to, I think... Did you see Roundtable? Yeah, it was very, very good. I think that one has legs. Where did Brad go? I'm about to go to... He hung up already? That son of a... His cellular cut out? Well, he shouldn't have bought a cheap phone. I told him not to buy that cheap phone. Big shot like him, all the money he makes as an attorney, you'd think he'd buy a good phone. I did like the round table, although I did not watch the full two-hour episode. I watched the beginning of it. I thought it was pretty funny where the... Uh, Secret Service agent, the the kid from Oklahoma with the uh, kicking boots, is right. charged with the protecting the president's poodle, and the president has only had the poodle one day, and it gets run over by a cop or something, and the two of them go out and buy a replacement a poodle. He wound up delivering a baby. He wound up delivering a baby? Yeah, in a taxi cab. Sure, and the cop wound up shooting somebody. What happened to the district attorney? Did those uh, teenage toughs ever get him, get her? Yeah, they did. They shot her, and she almost died. It, what? Like I said, it's a continuation. They're going to have the continua continuation. You mean in the first episode, a practicing district attorney yeah. gets shot? See, here's what was phony about that, okay? They get the kid who shoots somebody, guns him down. They're brought into court on a first-degree murder charge. The cop is there as a witness to say that he uh, apprehended the person. And then they give you the impression the judge sets a thousand dollar bond or a hundred thousand dollar bond first of all on first degree murder there is no bond you don't get out of jail you stay locked up you don't go free and the first thing you do is not go after the district attorney that prosecuted you not a bright thing to do well it was still entertaining though it was entertaining but it's one more tv sitcom giving a false impression of the justice system suggesting that you can commit a murder in the presence of a police officer and bond out the next day just doesn't happen that way okay norm i'll talk to you later on the week all right clark all right. thanks for your call still it was entertaining i'm not knocking it terry you're online too not that you care but you're online too good morning norm how are you okay um well i'd like to ask you a question did i understand correctly that steve Payne is not registered to vote well, not legally, because the last he communicated to us, he was still registered in a uh, North Dade County condominium that he either sold or does not live in. He has been living in Cooper City for the last two years, and uh, I think the law requires that you must register your place of residence within 30 days after uh, moving in. Okay. I'm not sure about that. I'd have to check with Jane Carroll. You may declare your domicile to be whatever you want it to be, though. So if Steve wants to say that he still lives in North Dade, even if the whole world knows he lives in Cooper City, that's fine. Okay, and the other thing... question is, I'd like to check his voting record. You know, it is public record for any of you teen researchers out there. Well, Mr. Kane can answer. He just walked in the studio. Mr. Kane, where, where are you registered to vote? I'm registered in <clears throat> my North Dade condo. But you haven't lived there in a couple of years now, so it must be troubling to you to be... It uh, doesn't trouble me at all. What registered does, to vote in an area where you probably don't even know who the candidates what are. Does, Who's in your congressional district? Me, what does trouble me is hearing you driving on my radio and listening to you live saying I'm not registered. That troubles okay, me. Okay, well, you're registered. But I understand the calls were a little Mr. slow this Kane, morning. Mr. Listening Kane, to you I'm struggle. Glad, I'm so glad I understand you're that's registered. when it's beat up Steve. Are you done making your speech? Mr. Kane, I'm glad you're registered. Now tell me who your congressional candidate is. I have no idea. I don't vote in congressional races. I just oh, vote I see. Presidential and races and gubernatorial races. Is that all right, Mr. Kane? No, no, that oh, sucks. Not no, right. that makes oh, you well, a hypocrite. That I'll makes just turn in my uh, citizenship. If you that would be group. appropriate. Mm -hmm. That would be appropriate because all you can do is apologize for your ignorance. You don't know who your city commissioners are. You probably don't even know the city you live in. Mm -hmm. You don't know who your state senator is either. Do I you? am not obsessed. Do you know who your House of Representatives? Oh, I see. Obsessed. That's Obsessed. Correct. Well, for a man.
man who wants to see abortion laws recreated so that people go to jail when they get an abortion, I would think you'd want to know Again, who your state house of representatives Don't you ever get tired of lying? Is. Don't you ever get tired of being so hypocrite? Have You're you telling me that you don't even know who your congressional candidate is? Have you told them about your appearance at Brothers tonight? I've been I've listening been for an hour and I haven't heard this is the big day. Well, why don't you uh, share it with us? My you don't understanding, think I've said last I heard, this is the first... WFT all night, and this is only not because of lack of response, but because the restaurant is so big, there are over 200 seats. It is the first one that on the day of the FTL night, there are still a few reservations available. Well, at last count, they had like 177 reservations. Well, I said, I think there are about 20 seats available. It is the biggest FTL night we have ever had well, it will with the largest I mean, audience it is uh, without any question. that we are ever going to have. So it's going to put more of a demand on talk show hosts to spend some time with our listeners and not to be gallivanting around so we'll have the microphone there to engage in a debate and we'll talk about the level of hypocrisy you generate by not knowing who your candidates are. You can lie in a mic in a restaurant. You can have that experience as well. You know it's amazing Steve that the truth hurts. Why don't you give them the number? I mean, I understand we haven't had our seminar yet, but see, nine, you, you six, follow eight, up an five, announcement eight, with that, eight, like there are 20 one. seats left with the number. Mr. Kane, yes. I know this. Go ahead. Who is going to do this? I, I in understand. fact, if you heard, I called in on Pat Stevens' show, and I called in on Jimmy and Charlie's show. No, I did hear that. I just didn't hear it on your show. So many, that's why I yeah, thought well, you Well, you might. haven't been listening, Mr. Kane. You've been playing with the hour. dial again. I've been listening for hours, although I will admit I've been going back to Joey Reynolds watching him die. I can understand. I can understand why you tune into Joey Reynolds. I really appreciate you saying that the other day you were listening to Joey Reynolds because it makes it easier for me to say that one of the reasons I very rarely listen to what you have to say is because you're on the same time as Neil. Well, you say that all the time. Nine six eight. Five, eight, Only I would eight, suggest one. that it's not quite as much of a sight to have somebody six, listening eight. to Neil instead of me as listening to Joey Reynolds instead of Well, me. I would agree with that. Yes, I would thought you would. Not much I would agree with you about, but... <laughs> Nine six eight five eight eight one for brothers. Still 20 seats left. Let me go to... Uh, Morning, I, right, yes. Before you go. Yes. What was it you called these Republicans? Right-wing, repressive, righteous Republicans? Besides that, I mean, we know they're that. I just wanted you to give a name, like they say, liberal Democrats. You had a wonderful name for these, Dem- for these Republicans. What was it? Goodness, I don't remember. It was spontaneous. Well, oh, well, you you I remembered it. It was a perfect label. Well, maybe somebody else remembers it. We'll see. Thanks a lot. All right, Terry, you're on FTL. No, that was Terry. This is Steve. <laughs> yeah, Norm. Yeah. This is Steve also. Um, um... I was going to call last Tuesday and expose Mr. Kane for the hypocrite that he is. Oh, well, by I, all means, this is the show to expose Mr. Kane. Yes. I called last Tuesday. Uh, I had a feeling he wasn't registered. Already. And, I, and I haven't been to Dewey County lately, but next time I'm there, I'll probably expose him for not being registered there also. My guess is that Mr. Kane probably hasn't voted in two or three years. The reason being is if he registers, then he'll get called for jury duty, and he wouldn't want to waste his time doing that. Well, now listen, he's such an incredible hypocrite. He doesn't... Can you imagine this man taking political positions on all these issues and saying that congressional candidates don't count? The last time I looked, Congress voted on the War Powers Act and whether or not to send troops to uh, Iraq. The last time I looked, Congress was voting on whether or not the... Uh, how, you know, here he is blasting the liberal Congress for spending too much money. and He doesn't know who state, his United States congressman is. Well, I mean, he's just the ultimate hypocrite. Hypocrisy at its best. I just hope people will challenge him and point it out when he gets on the air again and again. He doesn't know who his state House of Representatives person is. He doesn't know who his state senator is. He doesn't know the city commission in the jurisdiction he is registered in. He doesn't know who his congressperson is. He is not registered if he is all registered he is not registered in the county in which he lives yeah. here he is endorsing nick navarro and saying how sorry he is he couldn't vote for nick navarro he's not even registered in broward county he, and he can't vote in broward and he can vote one day if he's registered but only for president because he already changed his domicile because he, he has de- uh, declared a homestead he gets a 25 dollar break on his, on his property investment in broward he has declared a homestead in uh, broward so uh, he can't vote in data except for president. 
Steve, you've just made a very, very good point that because he's got that homestead exemption, Broward is what he has declared his domicile to be. Yeah. And for him to vote in Dade would be a, probably a misdemeanor. No, he can vote in Dade, but only, uh, only for look, president. He can vote in Dade, but only for president. Well, he's the ultimate hypocrite, Stephen. I thank you for pointing it out. My pleasure. So thank you again for calling. Good luck today. And let's go to, uh, well, before we go to John, Johnny, you there? Yes. Just hold on a second, because I'm more with Storm Norman on Florida's talk leader, WFT. No. As usual, Steve Kane comes in, and the lights on all the phones go out. I'm happy to say he's out of the studio and won't be reappearing here, hopefully, until after 9 a.m., when you can listen to the fraud and the lies and the hypocrisy he generates on the air in his uh, entertaining way from three hours a day. Interesting column by Steve Bosquet this past weekend talked about how Jim Howard's people were trying to spy on an Iran Cochran campaign meeting. And I'm not surprised to hear that former BSO deputy came in third in the six-way Democratic primary. Craig Glasser is getting help, or is helping Jim Howard's campaign. Craig, why don't you come out of the closet and admit your entire campaign was a front for Nick Navarro, that you were a paid chill for Nick Navarro, that the reason Nick Navarro... Back your candidacy, Mr. Glass. 